Greetings and welcome to week nine of our Mapping Our World course. Joseph Kursky here, your instructor. Week nine focuses on analysis, analysis. Remember that maps are analytical tools. They're analytical tools. They don't simply show us where things are, but they invite us to, first of all, analyze why things are where they are. Second, to look at patterns, uncover relationships, forecast trends, and third, and perhaps most importantly, they invite us to take action about an issue that maps are pointing out, whether they are about natural hazards or economic or racial inequality, about biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, climate, weather, or something else. This week's readings and activities focus, therefore, on a few analysis methods. Why do I say a few? Because there are so many things that you can do with maps in terms of analysis methods. Let me give you an example. ArcGIS Pro, which is a desktop connected to the cloud version of the ArcGIS platform that you're using in this course, ArcGIS Pro has 1,100 analytical tools. So even in an entire degree program, you won't cover all of those analysis tools. ArcGIS Online that you're using in this course has about 45 or so analytical tools. But even in this course, we're not going to be able to touch on all those, nor should we. I want to give you a an overview of what these tools are and why they're so powerful. So we're going to focus on just a selection of analysis tools. For example, the readings and activities focus on point pattern analysis, for example. Is the distribution of points random, clustered, or uniform? You've probably seen points on a map in the past and you wonder, hmm, are those points random, clustered, or uniform? And why does it matter? So for example, if you're looking at the distribution of low pH water quality from certain wells in your county, let's say. Why is a certain place, perhaps, in the county low pH? That's a bit more acidic in those uh, pH readings. Why would that be? Are they located near a landfill or is there something else going on? So you want to try to pick out patterns. That's, again, part of the power of mapping. We also discuss autocorrelation. Auto correlation. Now you may remember from maybe a statistics course that you took in the past about whether things are correlated or not, whether they trend in the same direction or in opposite directions. So autocorrelation is a way of analyzing the degree to which things of the same kind are related. For example, negative autocorrelation describes a pattern that defies Tobler's law. Who's Tobler? Well, Waldo Tobler was a geographer that said, all things are related spatially. Nearer things are more related to something in a specific area than things that are far away. Negative autocorrelation defies this law of Tobler. So in other words, in negative autocorrelation, the attribute is uniformly distributed across the area. It intersects uniformly with dissimilar attributes and is not concentrated. More about that in the actual uh, week that we'll dig into. But I wanted to pique your interest. Positive autocorrelation corresponds with Tobler's law. The things nearest or the areas, areas nearest to each other will display similar patterns or densities of the attribute. And the areas farther away display different densities of the attributes. For example, take your your neighborhood where you grew up. You might have a lot of houses that are fairly similar, and as you get further away, they become a little bit more dissimilar. If you can travel to New England or Quebec or France or Asia, right, you've got a lot of different kinds of housing stock. But near your community, in your same community, you probably have a lot of similar kinds of houses. Uh, you might have five or six main kinds, for example. No autocorrelation indicates that there's no discernible pattern in the distribution of the attribute. Again, more about that in the lesson and in the week that we're digging into week nine. We also get into proximity analysis. Now, let's say you've got a cer certain river or a stream. The riparian zone, as you may know from studying biology or environmental science, the, the riparian zone is the, is the zone near the stream. It has a certain kind of uh, plant life. It has uh, oftentimes wet soils. Certain kinds of animals are there. So it's the, it's the zone near a river or a stream. It's called a riparian zone. And you can compute that with geographic information systems. You can say, around this stream, I want to buffer, do proximity analysis by 50 meters or 100 meters. And I'm going to use that as my pseudo 
riparian zone. Why do I say pseudo? Well, unless you actually go out in the field and do soil samples and, uh, you know, you're, you're measuring the water quality and you're measuring the plant life and animal life and that sort of thing, you don't exactly know. I mean, this is a complex world and we can't say around every stream the riparian zone is 100 meters on each side. We can't do that. But it's, a, it's an approximation anyway. You could do that by proximity analysis. Another example of proximity analysis is, let's say you said, I want to find out how many tornadoes have occurred within 100 miles or 100 kilometers of Duluth in the last 60 years. You can do that with a geographic information system. That's another proximity analysis. How close it's, well, it's 100 miles or 100 kilometers, whatever unit you want to use, and you're going to count the number of tornadoes that pass through that circle, right? In that case, the proximity zone is a circle around Duluth. If Duluth is a point, that proximity zone would be a circle. If you're proximity around a stream uh in that example the the proximity zone is going to be like a like a puffy snake right because the stream is going to be on a map it's going to look like either a line or it's going to be a double line stream with area in in the middle of it in this lesson you'll also look at two two kinds of distance euclidean distance after euclid the geometry uh, statistician mathematician that is straight line distance so all the area within 100 miles or 100 kilometers of Duluth, like I was talking about earlier, that's a Euclidean distance. There's also a network or a Manhattan distance. Those are, those are synonyms, network distance or Manhattan distance. Let's say you wanted to find out the, the proximity in terms of network or Manhattan distance, all the area in your community, let's say Duluth, that you could get to within five minutes walk from the public library downtown or five minutes walk from the campus, or five minutes walk from the uh, Maritime Museum. That's, that's a, uh, in part, it, it's, it's gonna be an oblong shape, right? Because you're gonna be able to walk farther on sidewalks and streets. You're not gonna be able to walk the same distance if you're having to cross fences river channels and railroad tracks, right? So your your five minute walk time or your five minute drive time, or your 10 minute walk time, or your 10 minute drive time is gonna have this shape depending in part on the natural and physical features on the landscape. Let's, let's take another example. A 10 minute walk from a steep side of a mountain near me, for example, let's say Mount Elbert, tallest peak in Colorado. Okay, if I'm halfway up Mount Elbert, a 10 minute walk uphill, for example, is going to be shorter than a 10-minute walk downhill. I'm going to be able to cover more distance in a 10-minute walk downhill. Also, no matter if it's uphill or downhill, especially uh, on, a, on a very steep slope with a lot of loose debris, th those distances are going to be shorter than the 10-minute walk time from the public library in downtown Duluth, right? You're going to be able to walk farther in 10 minutes in a flat area, or I know Duluth is not that flat, but a, a, an area that has sidewalks and streets and stuff like that and paths rather than on the side of a mountain or in a rainforest or in a wetland. So that's a, a di the difference between Euclidean distance and this Manhattan or network distance. Also in the lab, you're going to look at some fascinating story maps. Remember, story maps are multimedia web maps that tell a story about a topic, an issue, or a phenomenon. You get, you get to choose three, but feel free to look at more if you have time. And in the lab, you're going to look at the patterns of two different business chains. Now, why business chains? Well, it's a, it's a perfect example of why these maps and why geographic analysis actually matters. You know, chains use geographic information systems to figure out where the what the best location is for their location of their stores. You probably already knew that going into this course, but just to reaffirm what your suspicions were, absolutely. They all use mapping and GIS software to figure out the location, the optimal location for their stores, whether it's in a chain or just a one or two uh, person operation or one or two store company. So for example, you've probably noticed the following phenomenon. There's a phenomenon A is, okay, you've got a gas station and across the street, there's another gas station. So that's kind of like co-location. You might have a, a Wendy's across the street from a McDonald's. That's a, a co-location. They, they both choose that area because it's got high traffic volume and maybe there's pedestrians, maybe there's close by university or a high school, that kind of thing. Then you also have the opposite, almost the opposite effect where you've got a certain a kind of business and it precludes, in some ways, other businesses of the same kind to be near it. So, for example, a car wash might be all by itself because eh, 
you know, if I've got a choice between two, maybe that that's going to eat into my sales territory, or if I've got a pet sitting business, or let's say a, an IKEA or a or a Home Depot or something like that, there's not going to be one right across the street, especially in the same chain. So you might have a certain kind of business that is the only one for maybe many blocks or many miles, or you might have a certain kind of business where there's a similar business very close to it. So looking at business is, chains is a fascinating application of mapping and spatial thinking, which is really what I'm trying to get you to do in this course. Think spatially about your world and your community. So we're going to look at two different business chains, which I hope is uh, interesting, it's informative, and it lets you apply the spatial thinking that you're cultivating through this course. That's week nine. I hope you enjoy it. I am so lost I cannot see. I have not brought my map with me. I have not brought my map with me. See you in the course.